This episode deals with suicide and self-harm and may be upsetting to some listeners, so please note that help is available if you need it by calling 911 or your local crisis centre. Hello and welcome to the Canadian Health Information Podcast. We call it CHIP for short. My name is Avis Favreau and I'm happy to host a brand new season of this podcast from the Canadian Institute for Health Information, better known as KIHI. Our goal, an in-depth look at the Canadian healthcare system as we talk to experts, health workers and patients about the challenges and potential solutions. A note, the opinions presented here don't necessarily reflect those of KIHI, but it is a free and open discussion about our beloved health system and the work that's being done to help keep Canadians healthy. On this week's show, are the kids all right? When COVID shut down life as usual in the spring of 2020, health authorities focused on the immediate physical dangers from the novel coronavirus. But COVID and the measures to control its spread were massive stressors on adults and children who were cut off from school, sports, friends. Some may have seen their parents lose work or their businesses. Some may have been witnesses to family violence. The data is showing the disruption sent more children and teens into mental health crisis. With her first suicide attempt in the night, you know, that she called 911 herself, waking up to ambulance lights in your driveway is kind of a real eye opener. So, you know, after that, I we knew we needed to get her some help. We've had like a 200% increase in numbers coming to our emergency room, increase in a variety of disorders, including anxiety, depression, eating disorders, substance abuse, and the system is really stretched. So we'll look at the hard numbers, how it's affecting families and the health system, if these changes are lasting, or if there's a way to turn things around. So first, a look at the data, and I'm joined by Ludmilla Husak, Manager of Health Systems Analytics at KaiHai in Toronto. Hi, Ludmilla. So um, when we look, we're trying to measure mental health in children. What exactly do you measure? So we look at the hospitalizations and emergency department visits. We also have uh, data on medication use. Uh, We don't have data on primary health care, but so we kind of look at it through the a hospital system lens, as well as through the medications lens. And what age ranges do you look at? We're looking at the uh, children and youth from 5 to 24. Okay. And so what did you find? So uh, this year was the first year where we started to look at the pandemic data. So first of all, we didn't see an uh, increase in hospitalizations and emergency department visits, but that needs to be positioned within the broader context. So what happened within the first few months of the pandemic, people were afraid and worried to go to the hospitals um, and they prefer not to go or seek care elsewhere. So um, the same way, uh, some people chose not to go to be seen for mental health conditions. However, if we look at the proportion of mental health to all other diseases, um, that proportion actually increased. So in fact, one in four youth hospitalized in Canada last year in 2020 were hospitalized for mental health conditions. Was that surprising? It is quite a substantial, quite a big number, I should say. What really surprised us is the eating disorders increase. And the group that really stood out for us was uh, females, girls, 10 to 17. So for them, hospitalizations increased by 60% and emergency department visits increased by over 100%, so 115 to be precise. So that really stood for us because uh, we look at the numbers frequently and that's uh, a rare occasion when we see such a huge increase just in one year. And that's worrisome. Yeah. Because you don't know why, right? Yeah, there are some uh, there are some explanations for that. So There are linkages to the screen time, to being isolated, uh, not being able to participate in the regular extracurricular activities and not being at school during the pandemic. So all these factors uh, might have led to to the increase. What other measures were you finding in terms of medication? Were more children being prescribed antidepressants, anti-anxiety? Yes, this is also very interesting because unlike hospitalizations and emergency department visits that had a slight drop early, medications 
medications actually increased. So anxiety and uh, um, so mood and anxiety medication use has been increasing for the last 10 years, and it's also increased in 2020. What is also interesting about this data that the use is twice as high in females compared to, to males, and that trend kind of continues over the pandemic. So even though people maybe chose not to go to the hospitals for emergency department visits, they continue to be prescribed. So likely they got care elsewhere through the primary care providers or elsewhere. And um, so we like to say that with the hospital lens, we are looking at the tip of the iceberg. There is also many people in the primary care or maybe not even getting care that we don't see in our data. And what about geography in terms of uh, economic groups? For example, for overall mental health conditions, uh, people living in the low income neighborhood are being seen more or kind of visit hospitals and emergency departments more uh, for mental health conditions. For eating disorders, it's a bit reverse. So it's people living in the most affluent neighborhoods are being seen most frequently uh, in hospitals and emergency departments. What does it tell us about the mental health of children and teens in Canada? Uh, Definitely there was an effect of the pandemic uh, on the mental health. Uh, Definitely it was a negative effect. Um, so some organizations declare it's code pink, uh, hospitals like SickKids or CHIO uh, kind of raise an emergency alarm in terms of the state of the children's mental health use in Canada and kind of um, calling attention to the issue. Do, do you think it's... I think I, it's I think it's warranted. I do hope, like as a mom of teenager and <laughs> an eight-year-old, I hope, uh, you know, I hope now that everything is reopened, the uh, mental health would get better overall. Uh, hopefully the pandemic um, kind of is slowing down, but we'll continue to monitor trends and uh, we'll see how it looks like next year. Thank you very much, Ludmila. I Thank appreciate you, it. Alex. Thank you for having me. Behind the numbers are families with painful stories, some who must live with the consequences. So we're going to talk about what happened to 16-year-old Lexi Dakin when she tried to get help for emotional struggles during the pandemic. So joining us now is Lexi's father, Chris Dakin, in Fredericton. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank you so much. Can you paint a picture for us of what Lexi was like? Uh, Lexi was, uh, you know, kind of a typical teenager, you know, she had her circle of friends, was active in sports, Uh, you know, we did a lot of family activities like skiing, camping, hunting, fishing, Um, ATVing, you know, she was a kid that spent a lot of time with family and friends. You sent some photos, she's a lovely, lovely girl. Did she ever have any signs of mental distress? Uh, not really. Like it was kind of, uh, it was kind of an onset quick. Like, I mean, I know she struggled with her mental health for, for a while, but I wouldn't say that it was, uh, like, I know some kids probably struggle with mental health for several years and like, that wasn't really the case with Lexi. Was it the pandemic? I'm sure that played a part. I don't think it, uh, that's it wasn't the only factor that you know with Lexi's mental health, but I'm sure you know the COVID you know restrictions played a part in how she felt. Um, Lexi was the type of person that liked a routine, get up same morning, come home from school, homework, you know, chat with friends, you know, activities. So, you know, when COVID hit that pattern in her life really changed you know she didn't have that group of friends to talk to every day at school you know and and I guess it's not the same as talking to somebody on a phone with snapchat or instagram or whatever like it's not that personal connection I guess that and you know I think that was a, a part you know sports were restricted which were all activities like see done so you know there were several you know, I guess, mitigating factors too. So so what did you see happen to her mood? She just seemed to get a little more like isolated, you know, once COVID hit, you know, she was probably in her bedroom a little bit more than 
she had normally been, you know, she wasn't as much in the living room, you know, with the rest of the family. Like, When did you start to get worried? I guess really when I first got worried was probably like Lexi's first suicide attempt back in November. Like up until that, I, I mean, I knew she was kind of depressed and sad, but I guess as a parent, you know, like maybe you have a blind eye to your own child, right? And you don't think that stuff's going to happen. But I, I guess, <clears throat> you know, with her first suicide attempt in the night, you know, that she called 911 herself, you know, waking up to ambulance lights in your driveway is kind of a real eye opener. So, you know, after that, I, we knew we needed to get her some help. So you went looking for help. What did, what did you find when you said, please, my daughter needs help? Uh, well, I'm sure um, I found the same as what a lot of parents, not just in your Brunswick, but across the country, that there's a lot of closed doors. Um, mental health access in Canada is not an easy thing to get. You know, we never really get the service that we needed from the hospital. Can you share what the diagnosis was? Uh, a depression and borderline personality disorder. I found the diagnosis hard to comprehend. I'm not a professional, so maybe there were telltale signs that they seen right away. And, you know, I've, I've never said that the diagnosis was right or wrong. I've just always felt that that would be a hard thing to diagnose with, you know, a half hour, 20 minute visit. How long did Lexi wait in hospital to be seen? I think it was almost eight hours. Was she ever seen by a psychiatrist? No. They went home before they could see her. So what do you think about her, What, how she was treated at the hospital that last time? Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm not, I'm not happy with the service. You know, if somebody goes in with a heart attack or a broken arm or a broken foot, you know, they get the service. And it's never a question of, you got a broken arm, I don't want to see you today, come back tomorrow. Like, that's never a question on something like that. But, but it just seems to be the way our healthcare system looks at a mental health patient were you worried when they discharged her that she was going to die? No. Even the night Lexi died, like her and I, I drove to St. John together, just her and I. And, you know, that trip, you know, we were making plans for the weekend and making plans for the summer. So, so I was never, you know, expecting that to be our last night. So, so it must have been an incredible shock. Could her death have been prevented? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's already been, uh, you know, after Lexi's death caused uh, like a fairly large media stir here in like New Brunswick and Atlantic Canada. And I know her story had went across Canada for a while. And uh, with the amount of media attention and stuff that her story had garnered, you know, by us sharing what had happened and, the scenario, like, you know, our New Brunswick Child and Youth Advocate team had commissioned a couple uh, reviews and reports. And, uh, you know, right in that report, you know, the Child and Youth Advocate team had determined that, you know, Lexi's death was preventable. And so. You must feel let down. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, it's been almost 16 months, so you kind of come to grips with certain things after a while. They don't ever get easier, but, you know, you kind of <laughs> learn to live with the heartache and grief, I guess. So, Yeah. A lot of parents wouldn't want to talk about solutions, uh, you know, when they're dealing with grief, but you've made it part of your mission to try and make things better. What would you like to see done when a teen like Lexi goes to emergency? You take a 15 or 16 year old kid that willfully admits to somebody that I don't want to live anymore. And then you presented me here hoping to get some help. And then, then, you know, the ER basically pushes you away. You know, it's almost like the ER is calling or a hospital is almost calling your bluff. Are you really going to do this or not? And that's the frustrating part as a parent. And I know there's, 
probably hundreds and thousands of parents that feel the exact same way as me is like, you know, what do I have to do to get my child the help that they need? So the province did respond with some recommendations on how to deal with kids and teens like Lexi. Is that a start? It's a start. There were 21 recommendations that the health minister promised that would have been implemented within a year's time. And I think when we did, uh, or I guess when CBC did the report on uh, those 21 recommendations, nine have been implemented and the others have all been are marked as in progress. What is your message in regards to ch- children and mental health? From that report that they were released, uh, Greg and Nicholas talked about the hospitals put a dollar value on the death of each child. And the number that he gave was quite a drastic number. This is basically what it cost our province for every child death that we have, regardless of the circumstance. So I looked at that number and I'm thinking like, if, you know, we'll say like $750,000 is what it costs the province for a death. Why isn't that money better spent in upfront care as opposed to reactionary care or cost? Like, I know government has to put more money into the hospital system to recruit more staff, to give better access. You know, we're going to have to have more mental health professionals, like, you know, psychiatrists, psychiatrists, psychologists, you know, counselors, that's all needed. And I'm sure if you ask any one of them right now, they're probably maxed out to their limits of what they can handle for patients. But there's a but here we need more. It might have saved Lexi's life. Chris, uh, I just want to say thank you so much. When someone is filled with grief, as you and your family must be, it must be very hard to talk about it. But hopefully somebody out there listening will hear your story and join in the efforts to get better services. In emergency rooms and clinics across the country, mental health experts are now trying to cope with what many say is a full-blown emergency. More kids who need counseling and medical care for depression, drug use, and eating disorders. But there's also a backlog of cases and long waits for care if they get it at all. So joining us now is Dr. Chris Wilkes, a psychiatrist in Calgary, and you work at Alberta Health Services. Hi, Dr. Wilkes. Hello there, Avis. So tell us what you started to see during the pandemic in terms of cases. Well, during the the pandemic, the the first um, thing we observed was a decrease in visits to all of our services um, as there was uh, that lockdown and shutdown of schools and shutdowns of um, other social activities. Uh, And then there was a gradual increase of numbers of patients coming to the emergency room. And that continued right until uh, most recently this this, uh, uh, winter and spring uh, when we've had like a 200% increase in numbers coming to our emergency room, increase in um, a variety of disorders, including um, anxiety, depression, eating disorders, substance abuse, suicidal uh, behavior. So we have been uh, very, very busy. Right. When you say 200% increase, that sounds huge. Well, we, we use the term a tsunami of, of mental health uh, referrals. Um, and as you alluded to earlier, um, uh, cousins south of the border, we'll say they declared a, a, a national emergency for children's mental health. We haven't declared a, a national emergency, but we are certainly stressed. Uh, and there is a, uh, a crisis in terms of support for children and mental, uh, mental health patients. Were there any cases that struck you, stick with you? The cases that stick in my mind are those cases where we were unable to save people. And there were certain um, situations where adolescents were using substances and and they died uh, accidentally, I think, as as an overdose um, because there's no one there to help them um, survive um, with a naloxone pen pen. What's the youngest? We are seeing, Avis, a lot more of the younger uh, children, 10 to 14, who are coming in states of distress and sometimes self-injury. 
uh, that they haven't uh, had the access to some of the other um, l- lethal means to hurt themselves, but they're in a complete um, disarray, disorganization, and need help. How do you feel? <laughs> You're a psychiatrist. You trained to help children. Yes, yes. Well, that's a that's a really good question, and I think um, I would speak not just myself and my my colleagues it's it's exhausting uh, and it is at times demoralizing uh when you realize that the the need uh for children adolescents is just so large uh all you can do uh, is provide um a small contribution to decreasing the suffering and the burden of suffering for families. Um, and there's a lot more that needs to be done in the community at the family level. Mm-hmm. One of the things that Kai Hai identified was a huge spike in eating disorders along with the waves. Did you see that as well? Indeed, we've seen a massive increase in eating disorders uh, across the age spectrum. Um, that, of course, um, has occurred in the context of also increased anxiety, increased uh, time at home, and and decreased supports with friends. Mm -hmm. Now, are there enough services for these uh, children in distress? We just heard from the father of a 16-year-old who waited in ER for a psychiatric uh, consult and didn't get one, and she died. What's the picture across Canada? Well, first, let me offer my condolences and that's a dreadful situation for any parent to be in um and then i will add we are woefully underfunded uh and we were woefully underfunded uh, in services uh, before the pandemic um and as you were probably aware with kai high data there was already a dramatic increase in the numbers of hospital admissions and the emergency room visits uh, because um, children adolescents were having difficulty regulating their emotions um, and then when covid hit uh, that just started to increase once the shock and fear of going to hospital um, abated then we saw a lot more of the distress in children and adolescents and eating disorders was just one part of it but the anxiety and depression for those vulnerable children in particular um, was so severe that they needed to end up being admitted into hospital is time of the essence here are these changes that you're seeing permanent or can they be fixed? I think uh, the majority of children and adolescents will be able to um, rebound back into some healthy activities as we open up our society again and other opportunities are available. There is a, a core of children and adolescents who were already vulnerable, um, but uh, because of the COVID, they've had less opportunity to develop coping strategies. So those children, adolescents are going to be struggling for some time, as well as the families who have experienced considerable economic stress. Some families, uh, as you're aware, have split up or there's been domestic um strife, a lot more calls to child welfare and uh, domestic violence reports uh, where the police have been involved. So some things for some people were so stressful that things got broken. And and when you break uh, mental health coping strategies or or break someone's self-esteem, it takes time to recover and and some may not recover. So you've written a letter, uh, you and your colleagues, a national call for action. What do you want to see happen? The Canadian Academy of Child Adolescent Psychiatry was was very struck by the fact that all um, areas across the country um, and people like me, division heads in child psychiatry, were experiencing pressures for service delivery for large numbers of children and adolescents. Uh, so what, what we wanted to try and coordinate is to make sure we had more of a national database so we can plan services in the appropriate areas and, and plan to have evidence-based services that are available. Um, and I'll give you an example. In our area, what we've identified is uh, school mental health is so important to have supports in the community because if they're not available there, then the children and the families end up coming to emergency room or they, they ignore the problems until they become so intense that they have to come to the emergency room. 
So we've advocated strongly that mental health needs to be in the community. Uh, it needs to be in the schools. Uh, it needs to be uh, supporting uh, education, child welfare, and children with developmental disabilities. In addition to the fact that we also want support in uh, our programs in hospital because there's just not enough um, beds or staff to look after the children who come in. Have you received any response? Any signs? There's been a good deal of talk and um, we are recognizing that um, mental health is one part of a very complex puzzle that the society is facing. Um, we, we believe that some of the um, funding that's being directed into the community um, is a good sign, but um, it's difficult to be fully optimistic because um, we are in a competition with other services. Is it taking a toll on you? Yes, yes. I think um, uh, the moral injury or, or burnout has been significantly increased for doctors. And we have lost some doctors who have moved away um, and um, looked at different types of work. So um, burnout, not just with the doctors, but also with the allied professionals is very significant. You know, the pandemic, let's just say it's not done with us. Is there anything parents should watch for and what should they do if their children, they sense there's a problem? If you see your child or adolescent withdrawing um, from their usual activities, having difficulty sleeping or being more agitated or irritable, um, difficulties um, with their studies, thinking clearly, and and actually saying to your to to parents that they don't feel happy or they feel there's no future um, or feeling trapped or feeling bored these, these are things that um, we would be asking parents talk sit down talk with your uh, child adolescent find out how they're feeling what sort of things are they concerned about uh, so validating can help your child significantly develop coping strategies. And, and the other part is obviously to try and look at reducing the stresses uh, that, that your child is facing. We have to remember that pleasure and fun are very important aspects of children's life. And if you take away play or reduce the opportunities for them to play, then it's, it's hard to maintain um, what we would call good mental health. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilkes. What we've heard today is heartbreaking and worrisome. The mental health of our children sets the stage for their ability to function as healthy adults. So thank you for listening, and we hope it sparks a discussion on what we all need to do to safeguard the mental health of our youngest. Our executive producer is Jonathan Kuhlein, and special thanks to Isla Goyette. If you want to learn more about Kai High's report on child mental health, please visit the website at kaihai.ca. That's C-I-H-I for the Canadian Institute for Health Information. And remember to subscribe to The Chip wherever you find your podcasts. I'm Avis Favreau. Talk to you next time.